Good evening. I want to thank everyone for joining us tonight for another Wednesday night webinar with the World Affairs Council of Maine. Tonight, as part of our Issues That Matter series, we will be hearing from Ambassador John Verano on U.S. trade policy. And this is an issue of considerable importance to the state of Maine and the country. And so I thank you all for giving up your time this evening to invest yourself in this important issue. Um, Ambassador Verano, thank you very much for being with us this evening. And I also want to thank our co-president, Andrea Hester, for being here tonight. Andrea is going to introduce our distinguished guest and moderate the conversation for us. Andrea, as you know, is also the president of the Harvard Club of Maine a member of the Programming Committee for the Camden Conference, and a long-standing instructor at the Osher Lifelong Institute. Andrea, thank you very much for being here this evening as well. And before I turn things over to you and let you get us started, Andrea, I also want to welcome you, our audience, and thank you for being here and remind you that we are very interested in having your questions. You can submit them at any point during the webinar using either the chat box or the question and answer function. Thank you. Andrea, over to you. Thank you, Allison, and thank you everyone for joining us this evening. A special thanks to this evening's sponsors, Jim Lando and Janet Edmondson and Bill and Nancy Hall whose support makes it possible for us to hold these programs and engage with distinguished guests like the one I am privileged to introduce, Ambassador John Verano. Ambassador Verano is currently Senior Counsel at Covington and Burlington and Burling LLP in the firm's International Trade Practice Group, where he focuses on international trade law matters and chairs the firm's Public Policy Practice Group. He has a distinguished record of public service holding Senate confirmed positions in both Republican and Democratic administrations. He was Deputy US Trade Representative and US Trade Representative General Counsel under the Bush administration. And he served as Assistant Secretary of Defense for Legislative Affairs during the Clinton administration. Ambassador Verano also serves as Legislative Director to former, to former Senator Bill Cohen and then for former Senate Majority Leader Bill Frist as well as serving as Chief of Staff to Senator Susan Collins. He's a graduate of the University of Maine Law School and the University of Maine at Orno, and currently sits on the advisory board of the Cohen Institute for Leadership and Public Service. Ambassador, thank you for being with us this evening. Thank you, Andrea. So I wanna start off by asking you about your background. How did you become interested in trade? And other than your service with the Office of the US Trade Representative, what general life experiences have influenced your views on trade policy? Well, uh, I grew up in, in Maine, grew up in Portland. And uh, as a kid, actually I had aunts and uncles who worked in the, some of the shoe mills in, in Sanford and Spring, Springvale. Uh, and my dad actually worked at a local Ford dealership. So I, I, I must confess that my initial impressions of global trade were not favorable. Uh, I was skeptical, even though most of the main shoe mills and textile mills, as folks may know, actually moved from Maine to the Carolinas to the southern parts of the states before they moved from there to, to some foreign destinations. But um, I, I was fairly skeptical, to be honest. And then uh, after law school, when I was working for then Senator Bill Cohen, uh, there was a vote on, on NAFTA, the North America Free Trade Agreement. and uh, Senator Cohen asked me to, to really uh, dive deep into the, the arguments for trade and against trade, for NAFTA, against NAFTA. And that was um, a really um, uh, important part of my own sort of grappling with the benefits and the, uh, uh, and the costs of having open markets. So I would say those life experiences beyond my professional experiences at, the, uh, at Department of Defense and USTR were probably the most influential. Okay. Well, that's very interesting. Um, how would you describe U.S. trade policy today, specifically in relation to other periods of history for trade policy, including any relevant main history that you could tell us about? 
Yeah, well, uh, Maine actually has quite a quite a lot of history on on the trade front, which, which I'll, I'll mention a few of them. But um, I would say, you know, now over the past five years, we're in what I would call trade 4.0, and I'll, I'll come to that in a moment. But I think we're in a new period of where trade policy is much more in flux than it than it had been uh, before. But you know, at the beginning of the country, uh, the founders were pretty you know favorable to trade. In fact. Uh, one of the claims and grievances mentioned in the Declaration of Independence was actually uh, a grievance against uh, the British government for imposing uh, an embargo on trade um, uh, with the colonies. So, so I think that the, at the beginning of, the, of our country, I think there was a strong sense that trade is good. Um, there was uh, a sense that, um, that it was important to help the country prosper. And so the first sort of 30, 40 years of the country Trade policy was pretty open, and it was uh, tariffs were in place of you know five to ten percent on many goods, not all goods, but many goods. But it's mostly just to generate revenue. Um, the federal government was was relatively small then, only about three percent of, of the of the economy, as opposed to about thirty percent of the economy today. So tariffs were actually a very important part of funding the federal government. Tariffs accounted for about half of uh, the federal government's revenue. So it was an important part of the federal government uh, from a revenue perspective, but it was uh, a very favorable pro-trade environment. Um, and uh, interestingly, Fort Popham, some people may be familiar with in, in Phippsburg was actually one of the initial sites of President Jefferson put in place an embargo against uh, 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 exports to, to Britain in response to an embargo the, the British government had put in place. So. Uh, this, this, there was some interesting main history just on, on the Kennebec River and the prominence of that river in terms of, of, of trade, of, of ship mass and other goods. Yeah. That's, the second that's period, okay. yeah, the, the second period was, uh, began around, actually coincidentally about the time the U.S., uh, excuse me, the Maine joined, uh, became a state around 1820. And it was at that point that Congress, which has under our constitution has the primary authority over trade policy and, and revenue matters. Um, there was a growing sense that, tr that tariffs were an important part, not just of revenue, but of protecting US uh, companies. And so over time, over you know, decades, frankly, there was this avalanche of more and more uh, uh, industries and companies that would go to Congress and ask for trade protection. So over the course of about a hundred years, leading up to the Great Depression, there was a, just a growing uh, abundance of very high tariffs, sometimes 50, 60%. And again, there was some interesting main history connected to this. Uh, in the late 1800s, uh, the Speaker of the House, James Blaine, was a very uh, staunch protectionist. And at the same, about the same time, there was a chairman of the House Ways and Means Committee, which has authority over, uh, over tariffs and trade matters. Uh, by the name of Nelson Dingle, and he was responsible for actually the largest tariff bill ever passed by the Congress. The Smoot-Hawley bill uh, uh, receives most of the historic attention because of its role in the, in the, the Great Depression, but the, the Dingle tariff bill was actually the high watermark for U.S. tariffs. So we had 1.0 was uh, free trade, 2.0 uh, from 1820 till, till about uh, the Great Depression in 1930 was 2.0, highly protectionist. Uh, and then after, after the Great Depression, after World War II, I think there was a, a renewed sense that, that open markets are good, not only to develop the US economy, uh, but also to help build better ties between, between countries after two world wars. So trade 3.0 from 19, you know, 30s, 40s, until, you know, frankly, uh, about four or five years ago, was for the most part a pro-trade period, um, some bumps in the road and some legitimate pushback on some unfair trade practices, very specific unfair trade practices, but generally a period of open markets and trade negotiations. And now this period we're in now is, I would say, much more mixed. It's definitely not has not reverted back to the, the, the full protectionist period that James Blaine and, and Nelson Dingley would, would, uh, would endorse. But um, I think a, a lot of pushback against China and growing concerns about the need for some more government intervention in the economy, subsidies for semiconductors and other 
industries that are deemed important to the US. So I think the, the, the 4.0 is still uh, unclear how it will, uh, how it will uh, ultimately conclude, but we're definitely in a new, a new period now. Interesting. Well, I wanted to ask you, um, when I was doing some research to, to figure out what I was going to ask you about, I came across a couple of quotes. So going back into the historical uh, part of it for a moment, if you don't mind, um, President Kennedy once said that the philosophy of the free market, the wider economic choice for men and nations is as old as freedom itself. What, what did he mean by that? Well, um, I, I should first say that um, uh, President Kennedy was a, was a free trader. Um, and interestingly, um, the two parties, while in, in recent years, Republicans have typically been seen as more of the free trade party and, and Democrats less so, that has flipped over time. James Blaine and, and uh, Nelson Dingell were Republicans and they were, they were the, the Republicans at that time in US history were the staunch protectionists. In the 1960s, the Democrats were the primary proponents of, of open markets and, and US trade unions, labor unions were very favorable to, to uh, open markets because I think they saw it, it mostly as a, from a consumer perspective, most of the uh, trade restrictions uh, that were being uh, considered were uh, with regard to agricultural products. So I think most of the labor unions saw trade restrictions as hurtful to their members by because they would increase household food costs. But Kennedy, I think, you know, was a free trader. And I think he tried to portray as he, you know, he had a great skill in taking every issue and putting in a, in a broader light. So I think what he was really trying to say in that quote is uh, free trade is part of a, a broader uh, story of free, uh, uh, free markets and free markets are part of a even bigger story about, about freedom. Uh, and obviously the government uh, rightfully uh, restricts our freedoms. If, if there's a clear public interest, I can't drive down the street going hundred miles an hour. That my quote freedom to do that is, is properly restricted because that would uh, uh, impose a great hazard on, on the public. But I think Kennedy's perspective was while when there are specific and compelling reasons to justify trade restrictions because of some public benefit, then those would be okay. But as a general matter, freedom, free trade should be and the freedom of individuals to make those decisions uh, should be left to, to the individuals. Okay, oh, that's very interesting. The other um, quote that I came across, you'd mentioned the, you mentioned the founding fathers earlier, um, was from Ben Franklin, who said that most of the restraints put upon trade have been for private interest under the pretense of public good. Do you agree with that idea? Is that a fair characterization? Well, uh, you know, uh, Ben Franklin, as you know, was, uh, you know, was, was a pretty insightful fellow. And, and I would say, you know, at least in his older age, somewhat of a curmudgeon, but, but an insightful curmudgeon. And I, I, I do think he was correct. He was, he was the first and many others since then have, have made a similar point that a lot of time restrictions on imports, for instance, are being proposed by companies that have a, that have a direct stake and a benefit in it. And so again, some restrictions are perfectly legitimate. You know, we have export restrictions on military goods that are, that are well-founded and, and serve a public benefit. And we have other, you know, uh, in some specific categories, uh, some import restrictions that can be justified. But many, uh, many import restrictions that have been proposed and implemented over the years, I think have uh, in, a, in a fair light followed more under the characterization of Ben Franklin's, which is they were more uh, favors to uh, particular companies or industries that had political, uh, had, had political power um, as opposed to restrictions that were serving some very clear public benefit. Interesting. Um, all right, I have one more quote for you. Uh, okay. Paul Krugman, Paul Krugman, you may be familiar with him, a Nobel Prize winning economist and writes an opinion column for the New York Times. He wrote last year that tariffs eventually reduce exports as well as imports. Why would that be the case? Doesn't. Yeah, um, I, I'm, I'm familiar with Paul Krugman. As you know, he's a, he's a Nobel Prize economist and has a 
very uh, prominent column in the New York Times. Um, he is, um, he, I think like other economists, um, tend to be pro-trade, pro-open markets, uh, even though Krugman is, is very, is not, uh, is for a lot more government intervention in other, in other aspects and other pub, public policy areas. I think his point there was that, you know, even though at first blush, it looks like if you restrict imports, you're helping US jobs, promote jobs, et cetera. But if you play it out a little bit, what the, the point he's making is imports and exports over time really do equal out. And it's sort of like a household, you know, you know, every household, you have a certain amount of income, you spend that on goods and services and consumption, but over time, you know, what you make and what you spend has to roughly equal out. And that's true with, with, uh, with, with countries and, and balance of trade as well. Some of, the, some of the members hearing this might say, well, aren't we running a huge trade deficit? And we have been, and that's correct, but we've been running a trade deficit because of public debt. So it, it gets complicated. I'll try to keep it, keep it simple, but we're, when you run a huge public debt, uh, the federal government is borrowing lots and lots of money from foreign sources. We end up in a way trading um, uh, treasury bills for goods. So, but over time, if you look, if you were to Google a list of countries to say what, is, what percentage of their economy is accounted for by imports and exports, that list would be pretty much the same or equal among each other, about, about 25 to 30% for most countries but they do even out over time. So Krugman is, is correct in saying that imports and exports equal out. So if you restrict imports, you eventually do restrict exports as well and exports provide jobs in the same way that, that, uh, that, that uh, uh, domestic uh, 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 consumption produces, uh, provides jobs. Oh, that makes total sense. Yeah, okay. Um, one thing that particularly interests me, I'd like to ask you about the decline of manufacturing. I grew up in Old Town, just north of Bangor, um, which had a paper mill for many years. And so I'm very familiar and many members of my family and friends are very familiar with the decline of manufacturing in the United States. And I wonder if you think that trade has played a role in that decline. Yeah, it's, um, you know, it, it's a complicated story. I mean, the short answer is yes, to some extent. And, and that's what I want to emphasize is to some extent. So Manufacturing has gone through a process similar to the, what we went through in agriculture. So uh, most people don't uh, believe this, but U.S. manufacturing output, uh, the amount of stuff we make or the value of the stuff we make, actually continues to increase and has increased over the past 40 years, you know, adjusting for recessions and whatnot. So we make more stuff today than we did 40 years ago. But because of machinery, because of labor-saving technology in, in the factories, it takes fewer and fewer people to make it. And we went through the same process, you know, 100 years ago with agriculture. You know, a third of Americans used to be farmers. Today, less than 2% of Americans are farmers. Yet we produce, you know, multiple times what farmers used to, uh, the farming community used to produce. So. Uh, what's happened in, in manufacturing, production goes up, employment goes down because of productivity gains and, and machinery. Um, but imports, you know, if you take a snapshot, clearly imports, if, you, if I'm buying towels or shoes or televisions that uh, uh, are imported, then that means they're not made in the US. So in that sense, they do uh, displace domestic production. But if you sort of don't look at it as, as a snapshot, but look at it as a movie. It's also true that, you know, when we trade with other countries, with people in other countries, uh, they get dollars and then they buy U.S. goods. So a lot of U.S. manufacturing, think of Boeing airplanes or U.S. agricultural goods like soybeans, a lot of what we produce here, we export. So in a way, it kind of goes back to the point I was making earlier where, you know, imports and exports over time uh, do balance out. And, uh, and so in, in that sense, I, I do think, you know, you, most of the studies that have shown that trade displaces some jobs, I think the credible reports are about 10 to 15 percent. Mm -hmm. The vast majority of U.S. manufacturing jobs have been displaced because of technology. Mm 
Um, but even those that 10 or 15% is offset by US jobs that are created by exports. And the fact that, you know, if I save a dollar from buying an import, I, I don't burn that dollar. I spend it somewhere else in the economy, sustaining another job. So it's, it's a complicated story. But unfortunately, most people, when they think of it, they, they believe that there's been a decline in US manufacturing, definitely a US decline in employment. And they attribute that to trade because trade, frankly, is easier to, to sort of uh, uh, focus on politically than technology. No one really wants to, you don't hear politicians railing against technology. Right, right. Before I ask my next question, I just want to remind our audience that you're free to ask any questions of the ambassador that you'd like to ask. You can put it in the chat or in the Q&A. So, um, I've heard it said that the United States has become too reliant on imports. Do you agree or disagree and why? Yeah, I, um, I think I, I would answer it in the following way. Um, you know, people trade, you know, countries, obviously we have, there are, part, there are parts of the US government that keep statistics about trade, but you and I, people on this call, it's people who trade. so. I'm not sure there's a there's a, there's a correct level of trade. The the amount of trade that that we engage in in our totality as a country is just a function of how much we individually trade or decide to trade. And do you buy apples, you know, uh, produced down the street, or a shirt made, you know, in the next state over, or do you buy apples or or shirts made elsewhere? So. The, the, the level of trade is just a function to me of um, the net function or the net result of individual choices. Um, as a, just as a reference point though, the US, we trade about half the rate of most countries. Obviously we have a huge advantage. We're a huge country, especially because of our energy independence now that we have that we didn't have 10, 20 years ago we can be much more self-sufficient and, and could be completely self-sufficient if we needed to be. But, um, but I think if we, it just kind of gets back to, you know, we're trading individuals are trading uh, in, in how they choose to spend their dollars, presumably because they see it as a, as a, as a net benefit for them. And so the amount of trade that we do as a country reflects individual choices. And I, I support uh, individuals having that that freedom, uh, sure. you know, with with very few exceptions, restricted. That freedom should be unrestricted uh, from the government, in, at least in my humble opinion. Okay, no, that that makes total sense. Um, when you're trying to craft a good trade policy, do you think that the interests of consumers should come first or producers? Which which one is sort of more important? Yeah, that that you know that is kind of central to most of the debates about about trade policy. Just to just to analogize it in antitrust law, in competition law, um, you know, laws against monopolies and against predatory pricing. Um, the law is very clear, and the Justice Department and the Federal Trade Commission, who have jurisdiction over those areas of law, are very clear that it's all about the consumer. So if a company were to come in and say, hey, um, this, this new competitor is hurting my business, the Justice Department, the antitrust uh, uh, authorities would really not be interested in speaking with you. They would just say, look, we're, we're, we're here. The antitrust law is about protecting the best interests of the consumers. I think, there's, I think that same logic applies to trade policy that it should be for the most part about what's best for consumers um, because that represents most uh, accurately public interest. There's a lot more consumers of any product than, than, than producers. So there will be instances where producers should be protected from unfair trade practices. And the, there are laws that specifically define those. But as a general matter, if, you, if, a, if a US producer were to simply say, hey, I'm being hurt by foreign competition um, without any allegations of very specific uh, and, and statutorily defined unfair trade practices, uh, 
my view would be that issue should be uh, should be uh, analyzed through the perspective of the consumer's interest and not uh, the government just protecting a, a company or, or or an industry from competition in the same way that the the antitrust authorities wouldn't protect a particular company from competition in a in a domestic sense. Okay. Um, next, I want to ask you about the uh, the elephant in the room anytime you're talking about international trade, and that is China. Um, since China joined the World Trade Organization in 2000, U.S.-China trade has grown tremendously. Um, um, overall, do you think this has been good for the United States or not? Yeah, um, uh, again, I, I the, the uh, I, pardon me for giving uh, a lengthy, multi-pronged answer uh, to do. the question, <laughs> but you know, there's definitely been a backlash against China, um, which, and some of it, I, some of that backlash, I, 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 I think, is well founded, and, and I'll come back to that. But just to sort of set sort of some historical context, um, you know, U.S. Um, and China sort of normalized relations, as you know, in the in the late '70s. And then the U.S. has been open to goods from China since uh, 1980, you know, and China has enjoyed the same access to the U.S. market as other countries. Um, in the 80s, um, China, for its very own reasons, decided that they needed to embrace market principles and open up their economy more um, uh, because it was, uh, you know, uh, it was a basket case in terms of its economic, put aside its other problems uh, uh, of, that, of that country and society, but economically it was really floundering. So a decision was made to open up the market and, uh, and both domestically and open up the world to China and China to the world. So that sort of began in the eighties and accelerated through the nineties and, and China's accession to the World Trade Organization, which is the global trade agreement, was part of that. But there's a sense that some people have that the US sort of allowed China to enter the WTO, and that's what really propelled China to its growth. What really propelled China to its growth is its own decisions, internal decisions to open itself up. Now, arguably, the US could have uh, reversed our openness to ch to China, um, but that would have that would open up a whole other uh, can of worms. Um, but but there is you hear in the press sometimes you hear comments sometimes that the the U.S. Um, let China trade with the world, and in fact China just made some uh, what I think turned out to be smart decisions to uh, liberalize its economy, and as a result saw just an unprecedented reduction in global poverty, um, the likes of which uh, we've, we've never seen, you know, hundreds of millions of people moved from subsistence farming to, uh, to, you know, the early rungs of a middle class. So I would say from 2000, uh, when China did join the WTO until I would say about 2010, I think there were bumps in the road, but China was abiding by its commitments to the WTO to treat foreign country, foreign companies fairly. Um, but under President Xi, you know, 2010, 2012, um, I think things started to kind of uh, go backwards a little bit. And I don't know how this story will end. I, I, I certainly hope it, it, it ends well. Um, but I think we had to sort of respond in a vigorous way to push back against some of the intellectual property theft and some of the some of the unfair trade practices. Um, but I would also say as a general matter, you know, US consumers benefited greatly from, from uh, access to many goods made in China and US exporters benefited greatly from access to, to China. China, uh, if, you, if you, other than Mexico and Canada are neighbors and countries tend to trade the most with their neighbors for understandable reasons, outside of Canada and Mexico, China is by far our largest export market. So again, we, we sell a lot of goods to China. Those support a lot of US jobs. Um, so it's, it's again, back to kind of one of your initial questions, um, Andrea, about you know, 
on balance do trade is trade good, exports good, imports good, they balance out, I would say, even with China, even though we needed to push back and need to continue to push back on certain aspects of their trade policy, it has uh, been a, on net a benefit to, I think, US, US consumers and certainly to many US exporters. And so now with President Xi sort of um, it being clear that he's gonna be around for a while, um, I know you said you can't quite see into the future, but if you had to predict, how do you think US-China trade relations will proceed from here? Uh, well, um, as, as Yogi, Yogi Berra said, predictions, especially about the future are difficult, uh, but I will, I will venture a, a, a prediction. I, I do think China has, you know, probably five or 10 years ago, there was a sense that, you know, it, it, that China is a juggernaut and they're going to be, you know, dominating the world in every sector of the economy in, in, in high tech and low tech. Sort of some of the similar concerns you heard in the 1980s with regard to Japan, where there was a, a, a sense that any fear that Japan was going to dominate, you know, uh, every sector in, in, the, in, in the world. Uh, that obviously didn't turn out to be the case. I think similarly, that's not going to be turn, turn out to be the case with China. Now, China has 1.3 billion people, um, and it has enormous, enormous number of very smart people and very industrious people. So China is going to be an important economy for a long time. Um, but they also have some, you know, some chickens that are coming home to roost now in terms of, um, again, in my humble opinion, opinion, too much government intervention. They got away from government intervention in the, in the 90s and the 2000s, which is what allowed them to grow so exponentially. President Xi is sort of trying to, you know, impose more, more government controls so, uh, over the economy, you know, again, put aside his controls over other aspects of society, but just focused on the economic interventions. Um, there's a tremendous amount of debt there that in the real estate sector, the banking sector are much more fragile than is probably widely understood. So I think China has, uh, is gonna go through some, uh, some challenges and the US and the European attitudes toward China are less um, uh, forgiving than they were frankly, you know, 10 years ago because of some of the retrenchment by President Xi, I think there's more concern and more of a sense that we need to diversify supply chains outside of China, et cetera. And that is ex exactly what's happening. Trade with China has, has declined um, uh, in some ways uh, uh, as a percentage of US imports over the past five years, but, other, but, but most of that has been taken up by other Asian countries like Vietnam, et cetera. So, uh, but China has some, some real problems that, that they're gonna have to uh, work, work through. Right. Um, I want to go back to imports just for a moment. What do you think should be done to help people who lose their jobs due to imports? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I think there's a, I think the government has an important role to play in that. And, and, and uh, you know, if we're going to have open trade policies, which, which obviously I, I support, I think the government has to also be mindful that like every other um, public policy, you know, there are short term, you know, winners and losers in these policies, and you need to have systems in place to help people transition. Um, so even though I think the history of blocking imports has shown that that doesn't really help people um, um, for very long, I do think we need to sort of, if we're going to have an open economy um, that's open domestically and open internationally, we need to sort of help, you know, there are some towns are very, they may be very focused on a particular type of, of product, um, shoes or furniture. And if those industries suffer a lot of um, uh, job losses, I think I kind of view those as hurricanes. You know, you, you need to sort of help those communities adjust. Um, and, uh, and as far as individuals, I think we need, you know, obviously we need safety nets to help people who lose jobs to help them to get back in the workforce. I do think those we should have those policies in place, regardless of why someone, you know, if I lose my job for trade or I lose my job because of 
technology or if I just lose my job because my company, you know, failed, um, you know, then getting having systems in place to help people get back into the workplace, um, I think are, are useful. They, they, they probably don't need to be trade specific. They should be um, ubiquitous for whatever reason why you lost your job. But it also, I guess the last point I'd make is probably also another reason why having healthcare less tied to your employment and more available um, to uh, uh, just generally um, through tax credits, et cetera, is probably a good thing because it takes some of the stress off well, if I lose my job, I lose my health insurance. That's obviously a horrible thing. So if we, if if health insurance were were more uh, delinked from employment, then I think that would help to ameliorate some of the concerns about uh, job losses and therefore reduce the pressure that sometimes exists in the trade context, but also in other contexts to have the government sort of freeze uh, things in place and intervene and 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 prevent imports or prevent other, other changes in the economy that may be good for the economy generally, but, but people are rightfully concerned about you know, the healthcare, et cetera. So having policies that are, that are more fluid and less and more portable, I think uh, are important responses to, to concerns over trade. Yeah. What effect does US trade policy have on our competitiveness in the world? Well, you know, I, I think the I think our competitiveness is is as a country, obviously, is a function of the competitiveness of individual firms and individual people. So, probably education is probably the most important uh, aspect of our of our of our competitiveness, um, as well as you know our regulatory systems and our tax systems and our infrastructure, uh, our environmental protection. So, I, I think our competitiveness is much more a function of policies sort of within the borders um, as opposed to our policies at the border like trade. So countries that are competitive, it's because they have a robust economy and they have leading companies and have a, a, a highly educated, highly skilled workforce. Those are the things that will really drive US competitiveness uh, as opposed to um, you know, restricting trade I think would would actually undermine competitiveness because we we we're, we're better if there if we're in a more competitive environment and pushes us to innovate and uh, and, uh, and 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 take advantage of a competitive market. Yeah. Okay. That yeah that totally makes sense. Um, I have a ton more questions for you, but I'm going to limit myself to one more because we've got a bunch of good questions from people in the audience. So uh, my last question is, what role does US trade policy play with regard to US national security? Well, um, you know, uh, just as an aside, you know, I work, as you noted kindly at the outset, I work for Bill Cohen at the Pentagon. So I went then from the Pentagon obviously focused on international matters on the military side to then USTR focused on international matters. On the economic side, it was interesting to kind of see kind of the, the interplay of, of security issues and economic security issues and trade issues. So I would say the linkage that I would see is, is number one, having a, a strong economy obviously is what allows the US to finance a very robust you know, military. It's obviously not a coincidence that we're both the, the, the largest economy and also have the, the largest military prowess and the most powerful military prowess. So uh, trade, to the extent that, I, as you could tell from my, my remarks, I think trade helps the US economy grow, is good for America. I think uh, open markets are, uh, help uh, our economic growth our economic growth allows us to afford um, uh, uh, a very good defense uh, apparatus. Um, but I would say also, in addition to that, the um, countries that trade tend to, you know, have, see mutual interest and mutual benefit. Sometimes that breaks down, but as a general matter, I think one of the correct um, uh, uh, assumptions after World War II 
when the global trading system was first built was to say, look, countries that have mutual interests, that have lots of um, uh, ties that bind them will be less likely to go to war. And um, there was a, a, a metric that uh, was used years ago. It's still not perfect, but it's, it's pretty good. It was called the golden arches uh, theory. And it, it was basically countries that have McDonald's don't go to war against each other. Now- I've uh, heard that one, yeah. Yeah, I mean, they're, they're, they're you know, sadly are exceptions and obviously we're, we're unfortunately living through one right now with Russia and Ukraine. But as a, as a general matter, it's not foolproof, but as a general matter, countries that, that trade together, um, understand each other better and understand the benefits of maintaining peaceful relations. Well, thank you so much, Ambassador. I really appreciate you uh, humoring me with all of my questions. And uh, I learned a ton. Thank you very much. And now I'm going to hand it back over to Allison because I think we've got some excellent questions from our world affairs audience. Thank you. Yes, Andrea. thank you. Thank you, Andrea. Thank you, Ambassador Verano. Um, and thank you, World Affairs Council audience. We've got lots of great questions here. I think I'm going to start with one here from Sam. Um, I think, how does or does free trade impact climate change? And would more restrictions or limitations on free trade have any kind of positive impact? Would it limit emissions in any way? Yeah, um, it's a good, that's a good question. I, I, I you know, clearly um, climate is a global issue. Uh, trade by definition is a global issue. So I do think there's an important linkage. Um, I, I don't think limiting trade itself will, um, will have much of an impact, but um, you know, goods move pretty efficiently. Um, you know, uh, uh, so I don't think there's a huge environmental cost to the movement of goods relative to you know, lights and energy and all the in cars, all the domestic sources of, of, of greenhouse gases and farming. So I don't think the movement of goods itself is a major component of that. So therefore I don't think limiting the movement of those goods would be would be great. The, the, the only thing I would add to that is is there is a connection as countries get wealthier. We certainly saw this in our country, but you see it elsewhere. You know, different, the, the more and more people uh, think of protecting the environment in a more uh, enlightened way. And so there is a, a, you know, economists and environmental economists have, I think, demonstrated, you know, a, a pretty positive correlation between upper income or income growth in countries and the importance that they place on, on protecting the environment. So from that perspective, I'm hopeful that as more countries move up the, the income uh, ladder, there will be a growing uh, sense that you know, protecting the environment is important. And certainly China has, um, you know, has moved, uh, not, you know, is moving, you know, has, still has a lot way to go, a long way to go, but has really invested a lot in, in uh, non-coal energy sources because of the degradation, not only globally through the use of coal, but domestically, you know, the air quality in Beijing and other cities has been horrible, but is much better now because there's been a, a very deliberate decision to, uh, to reduce coal uh, as an energy source. And part of that decision was because of, you know, the citizenry basically putting a lot of pressure on the government to say, look, we don't, we don't like to be, you know, wearing masks on, on, uh, uh, on any afternoon uh, in, uh, in Beijing. Uh, because of because of smog. That's that's really interesting and um, reassuring uh, for Maine Maritime and all of those places. Um, I think I actually saw something in the news that they're now putting sails on these great big tankers um, to make them even more efficient. Um, let's see. Um, question from Gail. How watertight is our government's monitoring of items that are supposed to be uh, not supposed to be traded? For, for example, nuclear technology, nu uh, materials that are illegal to trade. 
Um, I think certainly those types of products, I think pretty, I think there's very good, uh, there's always some leakage. There's always someone out there who's, uh, who's, um, uh, wants to evade uh, the law and, and authorities. But I, I think in terms of certainly nuclear, there's, there's only a handful of, of companies that have the, the wherewithal to produce uh, uh, goods of that sophistication. But I think even you know a lot of defense goods, uh, much less uh, consequential and complicated as, than nuclear uh, weaponry. I think there's a, I think there's pretty good compliance because this the stakes are so high. If you if you export uh, unlawfully um, some of these goods, um, uh, you're in big trouble, <laughs> and, and and most of your revenue probably comes from the Department of Defense here in the U.S. So I think most companies are pretty smart not to get crosswise from their main customer. I think that's a, a good point about U.S. companies, um, but one thing that's sort of running through my head, and I see a question here from George that's kind of in this vein, is um, how U.S. tariffs, um, recent embrace of tariffs, have impacted other countries, um, both economically, um, but perhaps also politically, and you know, what kind of an impact will that have on the WTO as a whole? Will it weaken the credibility? Maybe. Yeah, I mean, I you know, you know, we're as I said at at the outset in response to one of one of Andrew's initial questions. You know, I think we're in a you know we're we're definitely in trade policy 4.0. I think the script is still unwritten, but what we already know is is actions have reactions. So, uh, in the uh, the Trump administration raised tariffs on steel and aluminum products and raised many, many tariffs on, on many Chinese goods. Um, and you can, you could argue those, those were good decisions or bad decisions, but um, the fact is they had a response. We had other countries that raised tariffs against US exports um, because countries don't just stand by and, and let other countries impose tariffs, which is exactly what happened in Smoot Hawley and you know, smooth holly tariffs didn't cause the Great Depression. There were obviously much, there were bigger issues, but it exacerbated it because we raised tariffs. Europe, our primary trading partner at the time, raised tariffs. So you had just a seizing up of the economy that was that was involved in trade. And similarly, now you're seeing, you know, we raised tariffs. Other countries, our trading partners, raised tariffs, and you get more of a seizing up. Of that uh, of that economic activity. That makes sense. Um, I'm going to skip down here to an interesting question from um, Joe and Deb De Rivera, um, which I think I think I'm interpreting might relate to the WTO, but also sort of some of our negotiations. Um, they're asking, would it be helpful if there was more diversity in who is doing our negotiation and our negotiators? Um, could I ask diversity in what, in, in what sense? Um, Joe, if you're out there, could you um, broaden on your question a little bit? Um, I think perhaps what he's meaning is diversity in, in background, perhaps, um, from other, um, from other, Joe, um, can you type in there, perhaps? Yeah. If well, you'll type me, in there. Let, well, I'll let him give another, I'll let him give yeah. a second there to type something in the chat. Let me skip up here. I'm trying to group all the China questions together. So I'm skipping around a little bit. Um, here's a question from Ambassador David Pierce. What is your view on agricultural subsidies? They support specific sectors and producers, but are they a broad net benefit for the U.S. economy and consumers more generally? Yeah, um, well, uh, again, you know, putting my cards face up, I, I think subsidies, again, there's, there, there may be very special instances where they're, they're justified. But as a general matter, I think uh, they, they aren't on net beneficial to the US. They distort the market. And uh, you know, if you take sugar subsidies as an example, uh, 
um, they benefit a very small number of producers. Um, we, in order to sort of maintain subsidies, domestic subsidies for sugar, we also have tremendous restrictions on imports of sugar. So um, that ends up raising, even though it's subsidized, it ends up raising the price of sugar in the US. And uh, I don't think on net that's good for America. It's certainly good for a very small number of uh, families that, that uh, dominate the sugar industry in Florida and elsewhere. But I, I, I think it's, you know, sugar subsidies and sugar import restrictions are almost always example number one of uh, people give as an example of political protection, political favoritism in exchange for millions and millions of dollars of, of uh, campaign contributions, a very small number of, of sugar producers uh, enjoy protection that on balance is uh, maybe good for them and has made them wealthy, but isn't good for the average consumer. Um, just to follow and, up and, on and that. So, and sorry, if I could just add to that. I mean, if you look at, yep. you know, Maine has, you know, um, you know, robust potato industry and fruits and vegetable industries um, and other states obviously do well in those products. You know, we don't have subsidies for those. So I, I don't think you can credibly say we need subsidies in order to have a robust competitive agricultural sector. It's just that for various historical reasons, certain commodities sort of got in early on some, some specialized programs that um, I think ultimately, you know, aren't good for taxpayers and aren't good for consumers. Now, certainly the United States is not the only country that subsidizes their agricultural products, um, right? I mean, this is sort of a broader based problem that I think comes up in the WTO fairly often, or am I, I mean, I think I remember reading about that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. The, the, the Europeans, you know, again, for sort of similar historical reasons have, you know, a number of them, the French in particular, have subsidies for, you know, uh, for uh, some of their products. So, you know, I, I think what, what you hear from developing countries, and certainly what I heard from developing countries that I met with when I was doing trade negotiations is they view the subsidies by the U.S. and by Europe as hurting their industries. Uh, their domestic industries because they have a hard time competing globally with subsidized you know products from the us and europe so in a way the same arguments that we make against china for subsidizing some of their manufactured goods our companies and other companies say hey we can't compete with their subsidized manufactured goods you hear that from developing countries like hey we have a hard time competing against your subsidized uh, agricultural goods so uh, again it, it all to me comes back to, you know, hey, trust the markets, you know, you know, the markets have been around for a long time, they make mistakes, but they tend to correct. And, you know, having people at the USDA, uh, with all due respect, uh, making decisions about how to uh, second guess or improve the, uh, the market seems, uh, uh, seems unwise to me. Thank you for that. Um, and I want to loop back to Joe's question. Um, he's saying he means just broad sort of socioeconomic diversity in terms of who's doing the negotiation on the U.S. side. So more women, uh, more people from indigenous backgrounds, community organizers, people representing different interests, environmentalists, for example. I think that's what he meant by diversity. I mean, first of all, I guess I would ask the case, I mean, do you think we have diversity within the negotiating team that represents the United States in these entities? And if not, how do you think increasing that diversity might impact the negotiations? Yeah, um, the, I guess I would start by saying, you know, in, in my perfect world, trade negotiations would be very simple. You know, we sit down with another country and we say, we're open, you should be open. You know, maybe we have to carve out a few exceptions, but we're generally open. So it's, it's not a terribly complicated uh, negotiation. So in that sense, uh, and, and, if, and if that were the case, uh, you wouldn't need um, 
uh, you wouldn't need too many experts of whatever stripe or flavor uh, to do those negotiations. In terms of diversity, you know, experiential diversity, completely agree. You know, I'm a big believer in the concept of the wisdom of the crowds, but you only leverage the wisdom of the crowds if there's diversity in the crowd. So if everyone has the same life experiences, looks the same, thinks the same, you're not really getting a benefit of the wisdom of the crowd. So I, I do all things being equal. I do think, you know, any, any public policy matter benefits from having a diversity of life experiences uh, because that diversity uh, lends itself to a diversity of, of, of analysis and thinking about the problem at hand. Particularly when being in such a multinational, multilateral uh, context. Um, okay, so thank you for that. Now, I think we're going to get into the China questions here. Um, I'm going to start with Nancy Ross. And I mean, she's bringing up an important point, I think, that we hear often how should the United States deal with China's rule breaking, particularly with regards to human rights abuses. Um, several people have asked about intellectual property um, rights, but I think the human rights focus is, is particularly important because we've got another question also down here um, from Daniel Glover with regards to sanctions. Um, and I know those are two different things, but um, I think they're both relevant when it comes to China. So how should the US deal with that? Yeah, uh, very important question. Let me try to give sort of a, a, a framework. Um, uh, intellectual property theft, you know, you know, needs to be responded to, you know, in that sense, it's not trade, right? I mean, if, if you and I trade, you know, you make you make a widget, I buy the widget that's trading. If if I steal, you know, steal your widget, then that's not trade. That's just theft. So I think we should be very robust in responding to uh, intellectual property theft uh, by China or anyone else. And uh, it's why we need strong intellectual property protections um, and why there's a, one of the WTO agreements is called the TRIPS agreement and it's focused on, 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 um, uh, on intellectual property. So agree completely, we need to be, you know, uh, devote even more resources to that and respond in the face of, of, of intellectual property theft. Um, as far as human rights, you know, it gets complicated like, like most issues. Um, first of all, from an individual perspective, people have different um, value systems. So, you know, some people say, look, I don't, I don't buy any foreign products because I, I just believe in buying everything in America. I totally respect that. I don't personally want the federal government to make that decision for me, but that is just a value choice that people have and should have. Similarly, there may be people who say, look, I don't want to purchase any, you know, I don't want to purchase oil from the Middle East or from particular countries in the Middle East. Um, and, you know, I've spent a lot of time uh, uh, when I was in government and with clients in the Middle East, um, you know, it's a different society. Uh, uh, women clearly do not have the same rights that men do in those societies. I completely respect individuals making the choice that they don't want to, you know, if they can avoid it. They don't want to do uh, uh, trade with, with those countries. Now, it gets more complicated if we were to say, well, we, we shouldn't import oil from any country that doesn't have the same um, equality, gender equality that we have. Um, not many people in the U.S. have proposed that, and the U.S. government have proposed that over the years, Democrats or Republicans. And from my perspective, that would be a, that would be a costly policy to have. At the far end of the of the spectrum is, say, prison labor. I do think there is a strong consensus and a and a, an appropriate consensus that 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 we shouldn't be buying goods made by prison labor, made by forced labor. Um, and that would be a good example where I would say that's a personal choice, but it's so widely shared, I think, among Americans that imposing that at a federal level at a, and making that a statutory 
government decision that we don't allow imports of forced goods made by forced labor, that to me is, is perfectly appropriate. But you then get into different gradations where people will say, well, this particular policy by foreign government offends my sensibilities. Um, and again, I respect that, but whether those decisions should then be um, expanded to be national federal policies and prohibitions on imports from country A for, for this reason and B for that reason, it gets very, very complicated from a, from a human rights perspective. And I would distinguish that just to answer the last question, which was, which was a reference to sanctions. Sanctions often refer to national security sanctions. So obviously we have sanctions against Russia today for good reason, um, because that's a national security issue. So I would distinguish uh, import restrictions and sanctions that are related to national security as a, as a, as a matter of principle, I fully support, they in no way conflict with views about the benefits of open trade otherwise, in the same way that unsafe food should be prevented from entering commerce. Um, you could be the most ardent free trader, but that doesn't mean you would like to see unsafe food be in the, in the stream of commerce. So um, national security related sanctions, I think are, are are legitimate um, uh, in principle. Human rights, it really, it, it's, it's, a, it's a gradation and, and, and you gotta, in my humble opinion, you kind of need to take that issue by issue. Thank, thank you for that response. Um, there's, I wanna ask this follow up here from Nat on intellectual properties um, and uh, rights. Um, he says here, you mentioned the Chinese government encouraging stealing of technical secrets um, and copying. His experience is that more often it was Chinese entrepreneurs leaving a company and starting up using knowledge they learned while partnering with a U.S. company. At least that was the case back in the 80s. Um, and he's asking, and I think you've you know addressed this a little bit, but do you think the Chinese government is doing more to enforce intellectual property um, and sort of differentiating better between someone who collaborates or learns how to build a widget versus someone who just steals the widget? Yeah, uh, great question. You know, in the in the in the uh, legal term is trade secrets. So there are you know some things that I might learn that are sort of general enough that if I go to another company, you know, it's it's not considered a trade secret. Um, and there's no, uh, there's no prohibition on me using that knowledge in, at my next employ, employer, um, or if I start my own company. But there are other more specialized knowledge that qualifies as trade secrets, that if I start a new company uh, or go to a, a competitor and use those, there is a, a body of law, and I'm talking now just domestic law, that protects those trade secrets, and I think rightly so, you know, in, in principle. Uh, as, as, as the question suggests, that has been a, a, a significant part of the, of the intellectual property theft. Some of it, in fairness, may not qualify as trade secrets. It's just, it's just Chinese nationals uh, working in initially in foreign companies, they learn best practices, and then they start their own company, go to another company. And those, I think, you know, wouldn't necessarily qualify as unfair or, or inappropriate, but there definitely have been many examples, too many examples where, where it is a theft of trade secrets. And um, we do have some laws in the US, uh, section 337 of the Trade Act of 1930, allows the US to block imports if those imports are uh, violate US intellectual property. But there are many examples of theft that may occur in China or other countries where the goods aren't produced for the US, they're just produced in China or in that domestic market. So the question is, well, how do you get at that? 
Um, and since we don't have a, a you know, we don't, we're not going to send the U.S. military around the world enforcing uh, intellectual property laws, you put pressure on those, those government to enforce the domestic laws, which, which, which mirror in many ways the U.S. laws because of this agreement that I mentioned, the TRIPS agreement, the WTO agreement that requires other countries, including China, to um, enforce certain intellectual property rights. And China, you know, frankly, just hasn't done as good a job as they should have in that. And part of that initially, I think, was a was excusable, if I could say that, through a lack of capacity. I mean, it's it's complicated law. Um, you need a pretty robust and educated judiciary to enforce those. So there was a period of time that I think there was some uh, some space granted to China to allow them to sort of get the infrastructure in place to more robustly enforce these. But, you know, as we saw when they hosted the Olympics uh, in 2008, there's tremendous value in the, in the intellectual property and trademarks around the Beijing um, Olympics uh, uh, graphic and, and merchandise. And the, the Chinese government seemed to enforce those laws pretty effectively <laughs> domestically. So, you know, I think uh, it was it, it has been fair now for a decade to say, look, you, you know, when you really make this a priority, you could enforce your intellectual property laws and uh, you need to do a better job. I think that's a, a really, really good point. Um, set, it's all about setting priorities. Um, this is sort of a different tangent, but I think it's an interesting one. Um, um, Susan here is asking to take a non-Chinese example, how would you assess the costs and benefits of the U.S. free trade agreement with South Korea? Um, and you know, we have several free trade agreements um, with several different uh, countries, and so I think that's an interesting um, question to think about. Yeah, um, you know, um, first of all, South Korea is, uh, excuse me. <coughs> Um, it's an important trading partner. It's an, and it's a very important strategic ally um, in the region. You know, as China grows, um, you know, the importance of our uh, security relationship with South Korea and Japan and others uh, becomes even more critical. So uh, uh, there's a famous um, graphic that if, if anyone wants to Google it, you could find it. It's a picture from taken from space of North and South Korea at night. And you see South Korea, you know, is lit up with lots of lights and North Korea is dark. And it's a very stark example of, you know, two countries, one that embraced open markets and has uh, enjoyed tremendous economic growth over the past 50, 60 years. And the other North Korea that obviously took a very different path, a very uh, uh, regrettable path, uh, uh, imposing great hardships on its citizens, and uh, and it has had no economic growth. So, our trade agreement with South Korea was really about opening up South Korea more to the U.S. Um, the, again, the baseline for the U.S. economy is pretty open, um, and that goes back to our commitments and the WTO agreement. So, when you know, I negotiated a number of these trade agreements. Uh, I signed the U.S. Uh, Columbia Trade Agreement. The baseline is in all these negotiations is the U.S. is already pretty open. So it's about negotiating, you know, getting more and more openness from our trading partners. So, you know, South Korea still has some, you know, uh, pockets where they are restrictive, but uh, very few compared to what we had before we negotiated the U.S. Uh, 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 Korea, South Korea trade agreement. And, you know, I think if, if a South Korean were on this call, they would remind me and us that, you know, the U.S. has some restrictions too on what we allow in and don't allow in from, from, from Korea. So on balance, I think it's been a very robust and mutually beneficial trade agreement. And I think all the more important because of the growing importance that I think South Korea will play from a security perspective for the U.S.
thank you. Thank you for that. Um, we are just about at time. So I want to thank um, our audience for these really interesting and engaging questions. Ambassador Verano, I hope you found that we um, challenged uh, your thinking a little bit and uh, kept you on your toes. That's what we like to do up here at the World Affairs Council of Maine. Um, and also just thank you very much for being here this evening and sharing your experiences and your insights on this important issue. Andrea, thank you so much for moderating and um, leading the conversation. You're welcome. Um, thank you. Yeah, thank you. And, and let, let me just Go add, ahead. Allison, before we start off, thank you very much for, for putting this together. And thank you, Andrea, for, for the excellent questions. And obviously, thank you for the members for, for dialing in. I know there's, uh, there's probably more interesting and exciting things to do on a Wednesday night than listen to trade policy, but I, I appreciate folks dialing in. No way, in no to, way. Uh, to hear it. <laughs> It's it's an important issue um, and one that we don't pay enough attention to. So I am glad. And I also want to give a shout out to our advisory board member, um, Admiral um, Greg Johnson, um, a.k.a. Grog Johnson, for all the main black bears on the call um, for making the introduction so we could have you here this evening. It is really we're fortunate to have such a well connected and informed advisory board supporting the World Affairs Council. Um, audience, again, thank you. Please uh, keep an eye out on your schedules and our website. We've just got a packed fall schedule with more events coming up. We've got our Foreign Policy Forum on November 3rd with the Muskie School. On November 9th, we're going to hear on 75 years since the UN partition uh, resolution with Khaled Al Gindi from the Middle East Institute. November 30th, we have former U.S. Ambassador to Ukraine, William Taylor. And then on December 14th, Emma Belcher, who is president of the Plowshares, who will be talking about non-proliferation. So lots of food for thought coming up. Thank you, everyone. Thank you again to our sponsors for all your support. And I wish everyone a wonderful evening. Good night, all. <laughs>